one of the reasons that I love the Pit River so much is there's so many quirks in it of humanity and belief and things that you feel also have a little bit of fun to them, mischievousness as well. I'd like to sort of now talk about something a little bit different, which is a bottle that's got a witch in it. I'm here with Mara Gold, who is a research assistant as part of the Beyond the Binary project. So the old lady, living in a village near Hove, Sussex, by whom it was obtained about 1915, remarked, they do say there be a witch in it, and if you let him out, there'll be a peck o' trouble. There's this kind of thought that a lot of the people prosecuted for witchcraft were actually part of the LGBTQ community. My role was to look at the existing collections and see maybe what which objects we could bring LGBTQIA stories out of. So a lot of the other witch bottles that exist were to ward away witches and witchcraft. And often they were supposedly filled with the, the urine of the victims. And that supposedly would cause harm to the witch until she lifted the curse. So one, I find it interesting that a lot of these anti-witch measures were actually spells and kind of witchy things <laughs> themselves. So I find that quite ironic. But secondly, this bottle is different in that it supposedly contained the actual ghost of a witch. In England, the tradition was that, you know, it was mainly these women that were being kind of accused of being witches. So it's interesting that this one contains um, a male witch. So, you know, maybe he's a gay witch. Who knows? <laughs> My name is Olaji Owosheni, a PhD student in art history and archaeology. We are looking at an object referred to as Shongo staff in form of a woman. And it represents a prominent Yoruba deity, which is significant to me in the sense that I'm from the Yoruba ethnic group in Nigeria, West Africa. He possesses feminine spirits and is believed to have various manifestations. It is also interesting that he manifests as a woman too. In most cases, these Orishas are worshipped by priestesses. I think that must have been part of the reason why the image was depicted in the form of female personage. This figure is known as Erei Beji, the image of twins. This tattoo is always made for every twin born in any household there that twins generally are capable of granting immense prosperity. They are regarded as special beings in the Yoruba mythology. They are also capable of giving bad luck to those that do not honor them. Can I ask a question that might be really stupid, but there's only one of these. <laughs> are there normally two? Yes, in most cases, there are two. They have to have two. They must be worshipped even after they die. In fact, it's sometimes believed that most of these twins even come back, you know, like reincarnation. This is such an interesting introduction into such a broad and complicated set of gods and beliefs and traditions as well. My name is Will Cooper. I'm the curator of contemporary programmes and special projects at the Holborn Museum, which is a long way of saying I'm the curator of contemporary art. I really love what you've chosen so much. I just find yeah. them so yeah. instantly yeah. fascinating. Uh, they're sort of really grim. <laughs> yeah. In a lovely, grim way, if that's a thing. So I grew up in Bath and have been visiting the Holborn since I was little. And I remember being interested in some things and less interested in other things and finding these in a drawer. Please could you explain to me what they are? So they're probably smaller than a 5p piece. Wow. And circular, and then woven into them in human hair is a skeleton holding an hourglass in one hand and what I think is an arrow or a spear in the other hand, and then initials on either side of the skeleton's legs. So just hearing the line woven into them with human hair is something I feel I should pick up on. It's not a sentence that you say very often. No. They're symbolic of a different attitude towards death mm -hmm. we have now. When these were made, sort of in the late 17th century, there was a very long tradition of having memorial things. So memento moris, which this is sort of part of, 
the remember you will die objects that exist in art and in jewelry to remind you that of your mortality. You would wear one to remind you of the loved one that had died, mm. but also a way of having both a public and private mourning. This type of mourning jewelry would have been probably threaded round a ribbon and also, or maybe worn around your neck or worn as a bracelet on your wrist. There's a great story that Samuel Pepys had 150 of them made for his funeral. Wow, like them, favors. It, it, exactly like a party favor. And like you get, I have this image of like you get a party bag at the end of Pepys's funeral that has like a Kit Kat and a sure. morning slide in it. Miniature diary. Exactly right. I'm Gillian Stewart. I'm a bookbinder and designer based in Glasgow. This is Hoy Sound by Sylvia Wishart. She lived near Stromness. She started working in the post office when she was younger, even though she had like an art talent. And then she was later encouraged to go to art school and painted a lot of the sound across from Stromness. So the sea and the hills over to Hoy. The piece itself is, I think it's Ratwick Glen, but I think what's quite nice is that you can also see the reflection in the window of inside. So it's a little bit hard to tell what's inside and what's outside. Yeah, it's very um, full. There's so much going on there. Mm, it's very rich. Rich is the word, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a large part of the reason why I chose this is because of the connection that I had to it when I was on my internship. I remember physically being involved in the installation of it because it's really big. I think there were three or four of us who had to lift it up. Hoisting a piece like that up onto the wall means that you feel connected to it in a way that a lot of people don't really. And that's what's so interesting about the piece that you've chosen because I feel like that's one of the fewer larger pieces of art in the collection. It is smaller works of art that would fit in a domestic setting. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe it stands out more because it's such a large piece. But then even that is so interesting because it could have just been a wild landscape and yet there's still an element of the domestic to it too. She set it up for you and then you can just put yourself in there. I'm Pippa Shirley and I am Director of Collections, Gardens and Historic Properties at Wadston Manor. When you enter the house for the first time, what do you feel that it's trying to impress upon the visitor? The sense that you get instantly is one of extraordinary opulence. You walk in and you just think, gosh, there's something to look at everywhere. And it does feel quite overwhelming in some respects. Could you describe what we're looking at now? This object is one of the first things you might encounter as you go into the house. Yes, it is. It is a toy. It's a toy? It's a mechanical elephant with a musical box in its base. And when it's wound up, it springs to life. Wow! It was made in London in 1774 by a French clockmaker. They were designed to kind of show off all of the latest techniques in clockmaking and decorative arts. And I mean, the elephant's gone on being one of the star attractions at the manor. It now has its own Twitter account. Huh. It moves with the times. 